Dementia is a term that describes an impaired ability to remember, think, and make decisions. There are a lot of types of dementia, but the most common is Alzheimer's disease. It affects nearly 6 million Americans, and there is no known cure. I'm Dr. Neha Bhattath, and you're listening to Health Discovered, a podcast from WebMD. So my dad was the smartest man I ever knew. He just had this incredible curiosity. He taught himself how to play piano by ear. He didn't ever read music. He taught himself how to speak Latin because he always said that if you could speak Latin, you could speak any language. He just was always hungry to learn, but he was not snobby at all. He had absolutely no patience for snobby people. Yeah, brilliant, but very approachable. And I think that's that's why his patients loved him so much, because he, he really knew how to take care of them on an intellectual level, but he also had a great bedside manner. That's Lisa Marshall. She wrote a beautiful article about her father that inspired us to make this episode. Dr. Robert Marshall, who went by Dr. Bob, was a well-liked cardiologist in the Denver area for many years. He was really healthy, actually, in a lot of ways. He was an avid skier. We used to ski together all the time. He was a runner. We'd go running together in the dark before he went to the hospital and I went to high school. However, you know, he did smoke cigarettes uh, early on in life. He quit pretty early, but he smoked cigarettes in his teens and probably into his 20s. You know, back then they didn't really even know it was bad for you. And then he switched to a pipe and You know, he didn't like vegetables. He really uh, loved red meat. And he also was kind of a loner. I am too. (laughs) And uh, he didn't sleep well. And and that's something that is a common thread through our family. None of us (laughs) are great sleepers. So dad worked incredibly hard all of his life, really long hours, serving his patients and, you know, his, his whole goal was that when he retired, he would be able to go see the world. And, uh, you know, he did get to do quite a bit of traveling and do some fun things before he retired. But the plan was he would retire and he would travel and go take pictures and sail. He loved to sail. And he did get to do that for a while. But unfortunately, uh, it wasn't too long before he did start to have some signs of dementia. He was on a Jeep trip. He used to really love to go Jeeping up near Winter Park, and he was up on Corona Pass, and uh, he got turned around up there. And I think he probably was up there wandering around for a while, because when he told us about it later, he said that some good Samaritans had helped him find his way back. You know, he had some marks on his legs from, like, being scraped by the branches and things. And so I just kind of thought, wow, that doesn't really sound like something Dad would do. And then there was another time where he got lost in the parking lot after having dinner at a restaurant. And again, Good Samaritan, I think it was someone who worked at the restaurant, had to help him find his car. My siblings and I just kind of would talk about it and be like, what do you think? Do you think something's going on? Because this doesn't sound like dad. Dr. Bob was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Back then, it was much less scientific. You know, they just did these kind of neuropsychiatric evaluations where they would ask you questions and have you draw pictures. And so we took him in for one of those. And and I remember the doctor asking him what year it was and who the president was. And it was off by decades. And that was the first time I was really, um, that was a very scary moment for me because I was like, oh, there's really something wrong here. His doctor's own mother had Alzheimer's, and so he really had seen it uh, firsthand. And was, he said, "I'm I'm very confident that your your dad has Alzheimer's." In these serious moments, I think hindsight leads us to blame ourselves, even if there's nothing we could have done differently. I didn't feel guilt about it until a little bit later. It it just took a while to. You know, it was so slow. I mean, for many years, I said, I don't even think dad has Alzheimer's. I think it's something else because it was such a slow progression. But looking back on it now, I think it's because he had that cognitive reserve. He could fake it 
really well. You know, he was such a smart guy. He could just fake his way through it. And, you know, people would meet him and they would be like, he seems fine. And, uh, but so it was such a slow progression that I think I maybe was in, in a little bit of denial. And um, by the time it was very clear that he had Alzheimer's, then I felt kind of guilty. Like, I really wish it's not like we really could have done anything differently, but I wish we had just been able to know for sure earlier. Um, because it's a bit of a guessing game in the beginning. It got to the point where Dr. Bob's family had to make an incredibly difficult decision. Oh, yeah, he was resistant. It was hard. It was really hard. I think that's, that's you know, one of the hardest conversations that I think caregivers have with parents with dementia is about the car. Dad loved his cars. You know, he had a, a really nice Jeep, CJ7 that he loved to tool around in the mountains with. And he also had a Jaguar, which he loved. Those were tough conversations that it was, he probably wasn't going to be able to drive those cars anymore. It wasn't safe for Dr. Bob to live alone anymore. So after lots of heart-wrenching conversations, his family decided to move him to an independent living facility. You know, and it was independent living. It just you know, he wasn't alone, living alone in his own place anymore. And then after he was there for a while, then he needed a little bit more care. So we moved him to an assisted living facility. And then after a while there, we moved him to a memory care facility. And then we moved him again because we we just didn't think he was getting the care he needed at the place he was at. I think that some families might get to a point where they just feel like there's not much more they can do. All the facilities are alike and they're kind of stuck with what they have. My sister, Marla, was just, we have got to find a better place for him. And she started looking and found this wonderful place. It's a house and it's just brightly lit and it's got a big, beautiful backyard. And there's only 10 people there. The caregivers were wonderful. And He just got better. He got better right away. I think we were even able to sort of back him off some of his medication. I don't know how long it was after we moved him there, but we found a record. And my dad had recorded this in the mid-50s when he was a young man in college. And he actually wrote a letter to us kids that was tucked inside of the album And it basically said, um, you know, I'm having this digitally remastered for you guys. I want you to remember me from this time. I have often walked down this street before. But the pavement always stayed beneath my feet before. Yeah, it was him and his band and his three bandmates and singing all these old show tunes. And Marla played it for him. And he just remembered the words, you know, totally remembered the words. Does enchantment part of every door? It's called On the Street Where You Live. Just on the street where you live. Sang along with it and tapping his foot, and it was just really amazing. I remember sitting in the back yard and, you know, with all the green grass around, and Dad's got a suit and tie on, he's tapping his feet, and he's singing along, and that beautiful baritone, and it was just really amazing. He was still very much with us. I don't think he ever completely, he never completely forgot who I was. Sometimes he would confuse me with my sister Marla, but we look almost exactly alike, except for we're 10 years apart. Um, But he knew who I was until the very end, until the day he died. And that was a blessing because I can't imagine how heartbreaking that would be for him to forget me. Caregiving is a labor of love. It can be so overwhelming. You know, when I was really in the midst of the hardest part of being a caregiver, um, uh, <laughs> uh, um, yeah. Um, so I think <clears throat> the hardest part of being a caregiver is 
um, when your loved one is still there, you know, they are totally still there, but, um, they know that something's wrong with them. And, um, dad went through a time when he, he knew something was wrong with his brain and he would call every day, all day, like dozens of times. Um, you know, you'd just be like, Hey, Hey, Lise, you know, I think something's wrong. I think I might've had a little stroke or something. I'm just not thinking straight. And, and, uh, he would think he was at the condo skiing, or maybe he was at the hospital in the cafeteria, or, you know, maybe he was at our old house on Albion and he would, um, he would just say, just wanted to call. And then he would hang up and then he would call back like four minutes later. And, um, you know, I had two little kids at home and I had a very stressful freelance career and was taking care of dad. And he would just call all day, every day. <laughs> and um, I never wanted to not answer. So I would always answer. Uh, I wrote about it then because it was just, it was the hardest time for me, at least. It got a little easier when he kind of got past that phase of being alert enough to know that something was really wrong with him. I started it by just writing about the phone calls. Over time, I started to really look into the science and really wanted to write something that let people know that while it is a horrible disease and I would not wish it upon anyone, there are things we can do, I think, to hopefully prevent the worst of it for ourselves. And I also just really wanted to write something that demonstrated that just because you've been diagnosed with Alzheimer's does not mean you are dead or you're not valuable anymore. Because he was amazing and loved until the very end, every day. Oftentimes people are diagnosed with Alzheimer's and they are written off, you know, and, and I, no judgment. I know how hard it is for families, but people start talking about them in the past tense or talking about them in the third person as if they're not there anymore. And I think that's really a big mistake because as terrible as this disease is, it also brings out some really beautiful moments in people. I mean, dad was this busy cardiologist who was always running around with his pager on. And, you know, after he got sick and I'd go down and go take walks with him, he would notice like the color of a house or the, you know, how beautiful the trees smelled. If you have Alzheimer's, you know, you have to live in the moment because there is no past and there is no future. It was neat to be with him during that time. And um, I will tell you that in this last place that he lived, the caregivers there loved him like their dad. I mean, you know, because he just, you know, even in the last few years, he'd have his badge on and his doctor bag and he'd have his um, um, stethoscope. And uh, there would be other residents in there and they would be really upset and they would be like, I want to see a doctor right now. And they would let dad just like sit with them. They'd be like, well, Dr. Marshall's right here, you know, and he would like help the other residents feel better. One of the gals who was my dad's caregiver, she got pregnant right after he died and she named her son after my dad. So that's how much they loved him. And they only knew him when he had Alzheimer's. So um, so the point is, Alzheimer's, it hits all these other parts of your brain. But it doesn't take away your ability to feel um, love and and sadness. And you're still in there emotionally. And so, you know, you're more than what you can just remember. And, and so I just feel like people... Even in the very final days of Alzheimer's, dad could still feel joy and love. And um, and so we made sure to be there for him and help him feel those. Lisa, do you feel like the same thing could happen to you? I don't. I mean, I, 
you know, I will say, um, I don't eat meat. <laughs> I don't smoke anymore. Um, I've, you know, I run, I'm a, I'm a marathon runner. I try very hard to keep my brain active and I I've done everything I possibly can. And who knows, maybe I'll get it anyways, but, uh, but I'm not afraid of it. I have really insisted on, on ending my story that I wrote by saying that in a weird way, this has been kind of a gift for myself and my siblings in that we have adventurous lives. I mean, we all travel and we kind of feel like there's a clock ticking, you know, like maybe I will get Alzheimer's when I'm 72. So I hope not. But if I do, I can certainly look back on my life and say, man, I lived a great life. And, um, and I think we all live like that. I can hardly imagine how painful that must have been, how it must completely alter your perspective on life. We all experience the deep pain of loss. If it's quick, you may lose the chance to say goodbye. But when it's slow, you may have to say it every day. I don't know for sure which one is less painful. Remember to take care of yourself. Because I definitely remember some times when, and I know my sibling, you know, my older sister, um, who was dad's primary caregiver, I know that she and I, sometimes we didn't take care of ourselves. You know, we just, you know, weren't getting enough sleep or, or weren't eating or because we were taking care of dad. And uh, I just think you got to remember to take care of yourself too, even though it doesn't feel like you have time. Did Dr. Bob just lose the genetic lottery? Or are there ways to prevent and avoid dementia? To help answer this question, I spoke with the husband and wife, doctor duo, Dean and Aisha Sherzai. They're neurologists who specialize in dementia. Let's start with the one that's controversial, cognitive decline. Cognitive decline starts in your early 20s. Up to early 20s, there is this building phase. Um, the first nine months in the womb, then the first three years the fastest growing period of neurons and axonal connection ever. In fact, there's a point around age three to four where there's actually programmed cell death. You have more neurons and then it dies away to create the, the ultimate structure and then the connections continue. What's left behind after a few years early childhood is the ultimate structure of the brain. But the myelination continues well into our early 20s. And so the brain continues to develop. But then after the age of 20 or so, we start this degenerative phase because of our lifestyle, because of the food or bad food, because of our lack of movement, because of the stress, which is profoundly destructive, because of poor sleep where none of us get into the deep restorative sleep, because of lack of cognitive challenge around your purpose. It's repetitive behavior that serves not your ultimate purpose, but actually the neurons almost do a Wallerian pullback. That decline starts early, but here's the thing. That decline doesn't have to start early. You don't see it because you have a reserve. You have a bank account that you've built in in early childhood. You don't see the decline. You say, oh, I'm fine. I can eat whatever I want. I can do whatever I want. Well, that bank account is being pulled upon. It's being drawn and overdrawn until you hit the 50s, maybe 40s, maybe 50s. Definitely in the 60s, people start feeling the decline to the point where the decline is affecting some daily activities. When you can't do your finances or you're having significant difficulty, when you have significant difficulty driving or taking care of your medicine or making phone calls, which they call it IADLs, instrumental activities of daily living. When you're having difficulty with those, that's dementia. Now, there are many types of dementia. There's Alzheimer's, Lewy body disease, frontotemporal lobe dementia, vascular dementia, progressive supranuclear policy. I mean, Parkinson's dementia and even Huntington's dementia and others. The biggest one of these is Alzheimer's. 60 to 70% of all dementias is Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's up to now has been distinguished initially as an amyloid disease. Well, what we know now that it's not just amyloid, it's amyloid and tau. And we also know that it's not that distinct. It's not one disease. It's a multitude of diseases that come into one diagnosis. It's 
rare to find uh, dementias nowadays in a pure form, you know, pure Alzheimer's disease or pure Lewy body dementia. And that's because majority of individuals have some amount of vascular risk factors during their midlife, and that contributes to the cognitive impairment. So, you know, having uncontrolled blood pressure or high cholesterol that was never addressed appropriately during midlife, or some level of insulin resistance and prediabetes or raging diabetes definitely contributes to damage to the vasculature in the brain, damage to the neurons and its connections, and obviously contributes to that uh, cognitive impairment. So we see a lot of mixed cases too, which is quite unfortunate because when it comes to vascular risk factors, as you know, Neha, they're preventable and we can do a lot about that. I think that we, we have to become nuanced. Human nature is simplicity, but, you know, life is sloppy. (laughs) <laughs> it doesn't give you those nice textbook pictures. We think that a great majority of Alzheimer's by itself is driven by lifestyle, high blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, or even insulin resistance. We did a study. We looked at pre-diabetics in earlier life, in their 50s, and their cognition, and they had lower cognitive state. So if we can start early on doing simple measures at the public health level, at the community level, that will have profound effect downstream. When you look at the information that has come to us from wonderful studies, it's a variation of the same theme, which tells us that a diet that is high in unprocessed vegetables, whole grains, nuts and seeds, so sources of fiber and phytonutrients is great for the brain. And as as a result, it's great for the body as well. Fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, which are sources of plant-based proteins, nuts and seeds, which are great sources of poly and monounsaturated fats, those seem to be wonderful. Whether it's the Mediterranean diet, whether it's the MIND diet, which is a hybrid of the DASH um, diet, dietary approach to stop hypertension, and the Mediterranean diet, these studies have shown, like for example, in the MIND diet, it was shown that people who adhere to the higher quintile or the higher form of the MIND diet were able to reduce their risk of Alzheimer's disease by 53%. You know, that's a huge number. One study showed that when women consumed green leafy vegetables, they were able to prevent cognitive decline. And when they did neuroimaging, their brains actually looked 11 years younger. And then we have studies on blueberries that showed that when people consumed blueberries in the context of a healthy diet, of course, you can't just you know eat donuts and refined carbohydrates and eat a couple of blueberries and think you're good. You know, in a context of a healthy diet, blueberries seem to Uh, reduce the risk of cognitive decline as well. And so, yes, these foods, you know, kind of pop up, but at the base, you see this dietary pattern that is plant predominant, that's high in phytonutrient, high in fiber, low in refined carbohydrates, high in complex carbohydrates. And of course, when it comes to fat, saturated fat seems to be harmful Um, for the brain, and it contributes to Alzheimer's disease. And multiple different studies have shown that when people consume higher amount of saturated fats, which are derived from meats, dairy products, um, even coconut oil has a lot of saturated fat, they seem to accelerate that process of aging in the brain and the neurodegenerative, um, you know, changes that we see in Alzheimer's disease. Of all the fats, the only fat that the brain needs externally is omega-3. There's a lot of talk that the brain is made of fat, therefore it needs fat. That doesn't make sense. The brain needs oxygen, but you don't overwhelm it with oxygen. That's going to kill the brain. It needs uh, omega-3, specifically DHA. DHA is a very, very important part of the brain structure that that the body cannot produce, so it needs it from outside. So we have to be very aware of that. And, And we think it's a lot more important than we thought. Because when they looked at retrospective studies and even autopsies of the brains and at every phase, when brains had lower levels of DHA, they had much greater disease. We've talked about the why. I'm really, really interested in the how. And since we were being very honest, I will be very honest. Even being a lifestyle medicine trained person um, with a physician husband, we have three daughters and COVID and, you know, having young children really has hit us hard. And we have 
fallen down. Our kids don't have the best eating habits. Um, you know, I, I will tell you a true story. This happened this morning. My two-year-old, who is a COVID baby, woke up. I went to pick her up, and she said to me, the first words out of her mouth were, cupcake. <laughs> and then she said, ice cream. <laughs> And now I'm thinking that she, it's more that she knows her birthday's tomorrow and oh. she's menu planning for her friends. So I'm going to consider this a very high cognitive um, uh, ah, finding. <laughs> but clearly, we have had a very hard time. So, you know, what can we do? How do we do this? Yeah, listen, I I hear you. Um, and, you know, first of all, your daughter sounds adorable. I you know. <laughs> Second, it's our relationship with food, isn't it, Neha? I mean, the way we look at food, it's not just something that we put in our bodies and that's it. It's the memories that we've been raised with. It's the cultural aspect of food and how we relate to food in our environment and the stories that we create around food for ourselves and palatability, the level of comfort we feel with particular tastes and textures, all of this comes into play. So our choices are not just driven by what we need to eat to preserve ourselves. It's, it's linked to so many other aspects of who we are as, as human beings. And yes, there will be moments when food is not a priority. And I think we've all, as physicians and as individuals, been through that phase during COVID where, you know, the, the sheer stress of the pandemic, you know, completely prioritize other things rather than food. People just wanted to feel comfortable and good. So they reached out for some junk food. One of the things that Dean and I want to focus on is just that, the translation of the information that we have in communities and how we redefine our relationship with food. I'm not going to say that it's very easy for people to change their dietary patterns, but with health literacy, with understanding what really happens to our bodies when we consume certain foods without really boring everyone with the biochemistry and the physiology. But just, you know, every human being needs to know what happens to their bodies when they eat food and how they can opt for good food. And it's not going to happen if it doesn't taste well. Taste is very important. Learning how to cook is very important because that, that way you'll have control over your taste and textures and what you choose as food to nourish your body and your brain. And do you incorporate your children in this? How do you how do you engage them? Yes, they um, they are, uh, you know, they're curious kids. So I can't take all the credit. Uh, but we've made cooking and eating fun. Cooking is is actually an event where we all take part in. Dean's a great sous chef, by the way, <laughs> and the kid kids join in as well. So. Um, yes, I mean we do have our moments where we, you know, grab a frozen burrito and we're on our way to work. So it's never perfect, but for the most part, we've all inculcated the habit of making our own food and making sure that we're prepared when we go somewhere where we don't have access to healthy foods. My eight-year-old made this point to me yesterday, where she was like, "Because I'm not really cooking in the home, as I said, my husband's really the the cook, and I sometimes sue." Uh, sous chef for him. And she was like, you're destroying thousands of years of traditions where the parents cook for their children. What are you doing? <laughs> I love this <laughs> So I promised her I'm going to work on it. That was a wake up call, if, if anything else. So beside food, what other lifestyle changes are, are you working with communities on making? It's not one aspect of our lifestyle that matters. Obviously, diet is very important, but when you look at different levels of evidence, it's the multifaceted or the comprehensive approach to health um, that seems to make a difference, which means, yes, diet is important, but exercise is also important. Sleep is also very important. Keeping ourselves cognitively active, you know, very rough and a blunt proxy of that is education. You know, when you look at research studies, they've looked at years of education, but, you know, you don't necessarily have to go to college to be cognitively active, but just engaging socially and mentally on a regular basis makes a huge difference as far as protecting our brain is concerned. When we were writing the book, we came up with um, an acronym, self-serving, of course, because we're neurologists, the neuroplan. 
N is for nutrition, E is for exercise, U is for unwind or stress management, uh, which means e increasing good stress and reducing bad stress. Yes, there is such a thing as good stress. R is restorative sleep, which means um, getting a deep seven to eight hours of sleep that allows for the brain to cleanse itself. And then O is for optimizing cognitive activity, which I just spoke about, which means engaging our mind uh, throughout our life. That comprehensive approach seems to be one of the best things we can do for prevention of cognitive decline. And, and not just that, not just from a disease perspective, but allowing for the brain to have its peak capacity and reach peak performance at any age. People understate the power of these things. A study, several studies, but one study came that a 25 minutes of brisk walk, operative term being brisk, because a lot of our patients say, especially the men, Dr. shares, I'm fine. I walk the neighborhood. I do gardening. I'm like, okay, that's great, but that's meditation. You got to get tired. You got to get tired. So the brisk walk, 25 minutes of brisk walk, reduce your chance of Alzheimer's from a pre-dementia stage, from MCI stage, by 45%. That's not a nominal number. So one of the first things we start people with, which we call the keystone, the, the, the first point that's most effective is exercise. An exercise program that is doable for that person. If they have physical limitations, well, it can't be the running or jogging or even walking. So it could be a recumbent bike or, or a stepper or you know a foot pedal exerciser, but something that they can do repeatedly. And that actually sees behavior change most effectively. And also they see an effect most quickly. And then when they see the effect, then the nutrition follows and the, the, everything else follows from there. So th th these are amazingly important and real life activities that profoundly reduce your chance of brain diseases. I think that it's really powerful for people to understand lifestyle benefits compared to the treatments that are currently available. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So as far as treatments, drugs that are disease modifying, either stop the dementias or reverse it, there is not. The one drug that has shown a little signal, the Biogen drug, uh, Aduhelm, at this point, it's, uh, we're waiting to see results. It's very early. And whatever that was seen was quite small, let's put it that way. And so, but in, so at this point, we can say there's actually nothing that is disease modifying at this point that's been accepted uh, globally. And as far as lifestyle is concerned, Study after study, like the MIND study showed 53% reduction, 53 from zero to 53. Exercise, 45% or more. Mental activity, people who kept their brain active significantly reduced their chance. We're talking about about 30 to 40% or more, depending on, that one is a little complex, depending where you start, right? So all of these have shown profound effect. So when we said that 90% of dementia, or specifically Alzheimer's, and vascular dementia could be prevented, it was quite controversial. It, it is an extrapolation, so we want to distinguish, but the extrapolation comes from the fact that the percentage of Alzheimer's that is driven by genes at 100% rate or full penetrance is only 3 to 5%, meaning that only 3 to 5% of Alzheimer's are driven by the kind of genes that if you have those genes, you're going to get the disease no matter what you do. You might be able to affect it, push it back, but you're going to get it earlier. The rest are polygenic and mostly lifestyle-related genes. A common one is APOE4, the one that is most associated with Alzheimer's. APOE4 is a gene that codes for protein that actually is involved in transfer of lipids throughout the body and into the brain or outside. So APOE2 is a good version. People who have APOE2 have much lower risk of dementia and Alzheimer's in particular. APOE3 is a wash, but APOE4... If you have one gene from one parent, your risk goes up four times. You have two genes, one from each parent, your risk goes up 12 times. So 2% of the population have both genes, right? They have the gene. So does that mean that all of them develop Alzheimer's? No, 50% never do. Why? Lifestyle. There are many studies that show that lifestyle was the determinant. The amount of fat in your diet is the determinant. The amount of lipid, we're doing a talk on this um, fairly soon, is big determinant if you'd manifest the disease. So much of dementias can be prevented, not all, but a great proportion. Compared to those who don't adhere to a healthy lifestyle, 
those who adhere to two or three of the healthy lifestyle factors reduce their risk of dementia by 35%. But then those who adhere to four or five of them reduce their risk by 60%. Every year, the data comes back saying that adherence to more and more of these healthy lifestyle factors makes a bigger and bigger difference. I think that's a very empowering message for everyone uh, because it shows that even small little change that we can bring in our lifestyle does contribute to risk reduction of Alzheimer's disease and living in a better, uh, having a better brain. And I want to give a, a shout out to social connection too, especially as we age. You know, one of the great things that COVID did was it brought my dad back into our house. So we were a multi-generational family. And then, you know, we all kind of went our separate ways. And then with COVID, he came back to our home and really helped raise the kids and take care of us. And it's just the effect on him in terms of purpose and being active has just been amazing to see. So regardless of what family you make or create or, you know, connecting with people is also a key piece of this. Absolutely. Oh, this is, it, it, it's, I, I was smiling when you were saying that. Um, I'm so happy that um, your children and you had that opportunity to spend time with your dad. I think, um, you know, when you look at it from a neuroscientific perspective, the brain is hungry for information and for stimulation. Um, our brains thrive when there is sound, conversation, activity, um, and especially if it's in a safe environment with people who love and care about you. Um, on the opposite side, we've seen the devastation that isolation has caused in people um, during these um, you know, years of pandemic where people started having cognitive decline. And even if they had very subtle cognitive decline, it was massively exaggerated because of lack of social interaction. Um, people and communities who have a very strong social connection, they are able to uh, reduce their risk of cognitive decline and dementia later on. And we see that in very strong communities. That connection and that support that we create with individuals reminds us of what our priorities are. So in multiple different ways, I think it's, it's one of the most beautiful things. So what does that mean for us? Here are my main takeaways. The long-term effects of unhealthy living also affect our brains. Taken together, they likely play a part in most cases of Alzheimer's. Diet, sleep, social connection, and exercising your body and brain are key. Doing all those things can seem overwhelming in a stressful world, but focusing on just one simple thing, like a brisk walk, can make a big difference and snowball into other good habits. Genetics certainly have a role, but your DNA doesn't have to be your destiny. If you arm yourself with knowledge, you have a great shot at living a life that protects both your body and your mind. Thanks so much to our guests for sharing their stories and knowledge. Lisa Marshall is an award-winning health and medical journalist with 25 years of experience writing for magazines and newspapers. She wrote an article for WebMD titled, The End of Alzheimer's, which was the inspiration for this episode. The link's in the show notes. Along with writing, she runs marathons and attends grad school. Dean and Aisha Sherzai are brilliant neurologists that make up Team Sherzai. They have a lot of information about realistic ways to achieve a healthy lifestyle on their website, teamsharesi.com. Thanks for listening to Health Discovered, a podcast from WebMD. I'm Dr. Neha Bhattan, and I want you to be healthy, happy, and here for our latest episodes. So follow us on your favorite podcast app. See you next time.